Hello guys, welcome back. Uh, in this video, we are going to be solving an O-level physics paper, uh, O-level physics paper 2. Okay. Uh, the time we have is 1 hour 45 minutes and the exact variant is May-June 2023 variant 2.2. Two. Okay. So before we get into the paper, we should first take a look at the grade threshold. So this is the grade threshold. Uh, we are solving component 2.2. Two. So this is the threshold for component 2.2. Two. So as you can see, the full marks is obviously at 80. A is at 41, hmm, pretty low. Uh, B is at 29. C is at 17. D is at 12. And finally, E is at 8. Okay. So let's let's write them down. Um, A is at 41. B is at I think, 29. Yeah. B is at 29. C is at 17. D is at 12. And finally, E is at 9. So since the full marks is 80 and A is at 41, we can assume that A star. A star should be at somewhere around 60, 61, 62, yeah, somewhere around 61 and 62. So let's assume that it is at 62. So yeah, these are the minimum grades that you're going to be needing to achieve. Uh, these are the minimum marks you're going to be needing to achieve these grades. So yeah, so without further ado, let's get into the QP. So. Question number one. Figure 1 1.1 shows the speed time graph of a car traveling on a straight horizontal road. Uh, describe the motion of the car shown in figure 1.1. So they've asked us to describe the motion over here. So we can see from the graph that there are two sections to this, uh, to this motion. So one section is from over here to here and the other section is from 10 seconds to 50 seconds. So for the first uh, 10 seconds, we can see that the speed is constant, right? Uh, it is a horizontal line. So we can say that the speed is constant. So let's write it down. Um, Ten seconds, um, speed is constant. Now, from 10 to 50 seconds, as you can see, it is a curve with decreasing gradient, right? So this right here is a curve, right? So it's a curve, that means it's a curve at a speed time graph, which means that the body has deceleration. As you can see that it has a negative gradient, so it has deceleration. So we can say that for the rest of the journey, from 10 to 40 seconds, uh, the car decelerates. Yeah, so that is going to be our answer for 1A. Let's, uh, 1B states, uh, at time t equals to 10, the engine of the car is switched off. Okay, uh, the brakes are not applied. Uh, name two forces that act on the car to cause a change in motion uh, from t, from after t equals to 10 seconds. So we can see that it is decelerating, right? But the brakes have not been applied. So uh, there are two other forces that is working against motion. So in this case, uh, we can clearly say that the two forces that work against motion to cause this deceleration, uh, they could be firstly friction from the between the road and the car, uh, friction, and finally air resistance. So. 
So if we draw the car over here, if, even if the brakes are not applied, these two forces are acting on the car. This is friction and this is air resistance. So these two car uh, these two forces basically slows the car down and yeah and it causes the deceleration over here. Okay. Let's move on to part B2. Suggest why uh, figure 1.1 is a curve after 10 seconds. And yeah, so they're asking why it is a curve and not a straight line. Now, the thing about these two forces, these uh, these two forces are these friction and air resistance, is that they change, okay? They are dependent on the velocity. So as velocity decreases, the magnitude of their uh, their mag this friction and air resistance magnitude of these forces also decreases. So these are constantly changing. As a result, uh, gradient is not going to be constant. Their deceleration is not going to be constant. So that is why it is a curve rather than a straight line. So we can say that the resistive forces change as speed changes change changes as speed changes yeah so that is our answer let's go to the next question uh, 1c between time 10 and 20 seconds the speed of the car changes from 18 meter per second to 11 meter per second um, the mass of the car is 1200 kgs. Calculate the change in momentum of the car in this time. Uh, give your answer. Uh, sorry, give the unit of your answer. Okay. So they want us to find out the change in momentum and the unit. So change in momentum is going to be the momentum uh, before and after. So it is going to be bef before the collision. It is, sorry, not collision. Uh, at 10 seconds, the momentum is going to be 1200 into 18, and after and at 20 seconds, it's going to be 1200 into 11. So we just subtract them. So it's going to be 1200 times 18. This is the momentum before at 10 seconds, minus the momentum after, which is 1200 times 11. Okay. So now, if we do it. Um, we can take 1200 common and simply do 18 minus 11. So if we do it, put it in our calculator, the answer is going to be 8400, I believe. Yeah, it's going to be 8400. So 8400 is the uh, change in momentum. And now the unit is going to be kg meter per second so and also you can also give the unit as newton second that is also accepted okay let's move on to the next part which is calculate the average resultant force exerted on the car during this time so we use this formula um, f is equals to F is equal to uh, the resultant force is equal to a change in momentum by time. Okay, so uh, we know that the change in momentum we found out in the last part is 84,000. It's going to be 80, sorry, 8400, 8400 divided by 10. So F is going to be equal to 814. So yeah, that is going to be our answer. Let's move on to the next question. So question number two. Uh, figure 2.2 shows a rider on an electric scooter, as you can see. The scooter contains a battery and a motor to drive the back wheel. Say the name of the energy store in the battery. The energy store is basically chemical energy. Okay, uh, figure A2 states, describe in terms of work done, the changes of energy transfer from the energy store in the battery to the kinetic energy of the scooter. So 
firstly the chemical energy in the battery is being converted to electrical energy so electrical energy does work to um, move the electrons and as the electrons move um, this electrical energy is being converted to the kinetic energy of the motor which turns the back wheel so we can say so that is basically the energy transfer so we can say that um, Firstly, electric work is done. To move the electrons. Um, which which in turn in turn is converted to mechanical energy to, to kinetic energy basically kinetic or mechanical either one is fine kinetic energy uh, of the motor okay so that is going to be our answer to part A2. Uh, let's move on to part B. Uh, the total mass of the scooter and the rider is 70 kilograms. Okay. Uh, they calculate the total kinetic energy of the rider and the scooter, which has a speed of 4 meter per second. So we can write that the formula of EK is half mv square, right? So it's going to be half mv square. We know that um, we already know m, we know v, so it's basically half times. 70 times 4 and if we do the math it's going to be 140 joules oh sorry i actually made a small mistake it's going to be 4 square actually so the answer is actually going to be um, 560 so yeah pretty easy that was part b let's move on to part c okay Define what is meant by a kilowatt hour. So a kilowatt hour is basically the en it's an it's a unit of energy, right? It is a it is the energy when um, it is the energy needed when the power is one kilowatt for one hour. So that is our explanation. It is the energy provided. if the power is one kilowatt for one hour for one hour okay. that is going to be our answer so let's move on to part two the scooter stops working because the battery is totally discharged flat this means that there is no more energy stored in the battery the battery is in recharge using a 70 watt power supply. Okay. Uh, calculate the time taken to fully recharge the battery. So we have the, they've given us the power of the battery. And we know that the energy capacity is 0 0.35 kilowatt hour, right? So now, uh, and they've just asked, uh, asked us to find out time. So it's basically, we use this formula. Power is equals to energy by time, right? Energy divided by time. So from this equation, we just figure out what time is. So time is going to be equal to energy by P. And so this energy, uh, this time, this energy is going to be 0 0.35 kilowatt hour. And it's going to be divided by P, which is power, is 70 watts. Um, we have to convert this 70 watts into kilowatts as well. So if we convert, it's going to be 0 0.07 kilowatts. So it's going to be 0 0.35 divided by 0 0.07. And our time is going to be 5 hours, 5.0 hours. So it's going to be 5 hours, basically. And that is our answer to part C2. Let's move on to the next question, which is question number 3. Describe why rotating the tube changes the pressure of the gas in the sealed end. So they've asked us that, 
uh, if we go from 3.1 to 3.0 first let's read the question uh, a fixed mass of gas in a glass tube is trapped by a seal uh, at one end of the tube and a column of mercury okay uh, the mercury is free to move between the tube as we can see this is the mercury and it's free to move in the tube the tube is rotated slowly from the vertical as shown in 3.1 to horizontal as shown in 3.2 the volume of the gas increases and its temperature remains constant okay described by rotating the tube, tube changes the pressure of the gas in the sealed end so basically uh, when it is in its vertical position um, over here in this sealed end uh, the atmospheric pressure is acting on it as well as the pressure exerted by this mercury right the pressure exerted by this mercury and its mathematical form is h rho g so when it's vertical both of these are acting on the seal end. but when it is horizontal only the atmospheric pressure is acting on it this mercury this mercury over here it doesn't affect it is not exerting any force over uh, on the sealed end uh, it is exerting pressure downwards right so yeah it is not exerting any pressure on the sealed end so that is going to be our answer that uh, mercury stops uh, when it is horizontal mercury stops exerting a pressure on the sealed end so that's why the pressure in the sealed end changes so mercury stops exerting a pressure on the sealed end okay so that is going to be our answer in part two the rest is to explain using ideas about particles why the pressure of the gas decreases when the volume increases okay so the pressure of the gas is basically caused due to the uh, due to the collision between the gas molecules with the walls of the container right the gas molecules hit the, the walls of the container so uh, when uh, the volume increases when you increase the volume uh, the particles are going to hit the container much less okay so there will be fewer hits per second on the wall so as a result since there is fewer hits per second uh, this would mean that uh, there is fewer uh, force is exerted on the wall. As a result, uh, pressure is going to decrease. Okay. I hope that's clear. So, we have to write that. Uh, due to particles hitting the walls. Okay, now when volume increases, volume increases, um, there is fewer hits per second so force exerted decreases force decreases so pressure decreases okay so that is uh, part 3a2 let's move on to part 3b okay in figure 3.1 the length of the mercury column is 0 0.3 meters the density is 1400 14000 and the atmospheric pressure they've given us so calculate the pressure of the gas in the tube so basically um this gas pressure over here uh, the pressure exerted by this gas this is basically equal to the um this is basically equal to the atmospheric pressure 
plus the pressure exerted by um, it's equal to this atmospheric pressure right here and the pressure exerted by this mercury i've already written down the formula so yeah we just need to calculate it we already know what the atmospheric pressure is so let's just use this these three parameters to find out the uh, pressure exerted by the uh, mercury so we can write uh, pressure is going to be equal to h rho g h is 0 0.3 rho is 14,000 and g is 9.8 so if we do it in our calculators it's going to be sorry 9.81 actually no. 14,000 9.81 so it's basically going to be approximately 41,000 41,202 pascals so that is the pressure exerted by the mercury now therefore gas pressure uh, is going to be equal to 41,202 plus 1 into 10 to the power 5 pascals we add it with the uh, we add it with the atmospheric pressure so it's going to be uh, 141202 pascals now we just convert it to two significant figures it's going to be for 140000 pascals so that is going to be our answer 140000 pascals okay let's move on to the next question question number c the pressure of a different sample of gas changes at constant temperature Figure 3.3 shows one point marked X on the graph uh, of pressure against volume uh, of the gas sample. So we have this that when uh, uh, v when p z when pressure is at p zero, a volume is at v zero. Okay. So they have asked us to sketch the graph of pressure of uh, gas from two p to half p. Oh. So they have asked us to draw the graph of pressure against volume right now basically we just apply the Boyle's law which states that the pressure is inversely proportional to volume given that uh, given that temperature is constant so uh, we can write that pressure is equal to k by v let k be uh, any constant so pv is equal to k so P the product of pressure and volume is always constant so we can we know that the product of pressure and volume is p0 v0 right so over here it's p0 v0 so it is going to be equal to p0 v0 everywhere so let's say when uh, pressure is at 2p 2p0 over here when the pressure is 2p0 2p0 is going to be multiplied with some volume so we have to find out the volume basically so volume is going to be equal to v0 by 2 right so when pressure is 2p0 our volume is going to be v, half v0 so it's going to be over here and um, similarly um, similarly we can say when uh, p0 v0 is equal when Pressure is half P0, half P is equals half P0 times V. So P0, P0 cancels out, V is going to be equal to 2V0. So when pressure is half P0, volume is 2V0. So it's over here. So now let's basically just draw a line through these three points. And we have our graph. So yeah, that is going to be our graph. Um, let's move on to the next question. Yeah. Figure 4.1 shows the particle uh, particles atoms at one instant uh, all in a sample of iron at a temperature below its melting point. So this is at a temperature below its melting point, right? Okay. For A1, say to state the lowest temperature possible on the Celsius scale and the Kelvin scale. So it actually this A1 question has nothing to do with the top diagram. So they've asked us to 
stayed the lowest possible temperature on the Celsius and the Kelvin scale. Kelvin scale. So we know that the lowest temperature at the Kelvin scale is zero. This is known as the absolute zero temperature. So when the, the temperature at the Kelvin scale is zero, the temperature in the Celsius scale is going to be minus 273. Okay, that is uh, going to be our answer. In part A2, the vast as the temperature of the solid increases, the sample remains a solid. Okay, this remains a solid. Uh, describe how the motion of the particles changes. Um, even though temperature is increased, the sample is still a solid, right? So basically, the only change it's going to be is that the particles are going to move faster, is going to vibrate faster with larger amplitude. So that is going to be our answer. Since they cannot really move, they can just vibrate about in fixed positions, right? So the particles vibrate faster with higher amplitude. So that is going to be our answer for A2. For A3 states that the solid melts, okay, basically the solid melts. Okay. State what happens to the internal energy and the temperature of the solid as it melts. So they're asking us what happens to the internal energy. So when the solid melts from a solid to a liquid, internal energy always increases. But when it is melting, the temperature is always constant. So temperature is constant, no change. It stays the same. So that is for it for question 4a. Let's move on to 4b. Okay. It states that um, a student places a 300 gram piece of iron in boiling water until the iron is at the temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. It removes the iron from the water and places it immediately into, a into 100 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, the iron cools and the water warms until both of them uh, reach the same temperature of 44 degrees Celsius. Okay, the specific uh, it's the specific heat capacity heat capacity of water is 4.2 joule per gram per degree Celsius. Okay, uh, no energy is lost in the surroundings. Okay, I see. Uh, calculate the change in internal energy of the water as it warms up. So the change in internal energy, we can find it using this formula. Um, Q is equals to mc delta theta. Uh, we just have to, we know what m is. m is basically 100 grams of water. So 100 times 4.2, which is the heat capacity, times the temperature change, which is from 25 to 44. So 44 minus 25. So it is going to be 44 minus 25 is 19 times 4.2 times 100. So it's going to be 8,000 joules. That is going to be our answer. For part V2, calculate the specific heat capacity of iron. Okay. Now, one thing to note is that the change in energy of water is going to be equal to the change in energy of iron. Okay, so we can say that 8000 is equals to mc delta theta, except that this mc delta theta is for iron. Okay, so m for iron, m for iron is 300 grams. Okay, 300 grams times c times uh, del theta, which is the change in temperature, is 100 minus 44. That is a change in temperature for iron. Now, if we uh, uh, make C the subject and solve this equation, uh, C is going to be equal to uh, 8000 by, by 300 times 100 minus 44, which is going to be 56. C is going to be uh, 0 0.476 right yeah so it's 0 0.476 which is basically 0 0.48 so that is my answer to 4b let's move on to number five 
water waves are uh, transverse waves okay uh, determine uh, sorry underline two other examples of transverse waves so let's see uh, seismic p waves seismic s waves sound waves and x rays right so it's going to be size uh, the transverse waves are going to be seismic p waves and x rays so these are going to be our answers a yeah, basic general knowledge question let's move on to part b the figure 5.1 shows a wooden bar and a glass block in a ripple tank the depth of water in the tank is less than the height of the glass block okay um the wooden bar moves up and down once every 0 0.15 seconds to create the crest okay speed of the water is 27 centimeter per second and they've asked us to calculate the frequency and the weight so since the wooden bar moves every 0 0.15 seconds we can say that this is the time period and we know therefore frequency is 1 by time period and if we mean if we use this formula it's going to be 1 by 0 0.15 and frequency is going to be uh, 6.67 basically 6.7 hertz now for a wavelength um, we know that the speed is 27 centimeter per second and we just found out the frequency. So we use these two to find uh, the wavelength. So it's going to be, um, sorry, it's going to be speed equals to, speed equals to F lambda. If we make lambda the subject, it's going to be speed by frequency, which is 27 divided by 6.7. And our lambda is going to be 4, I believe. Yeah, 4 centimeter. 4.0 centimeter. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, the wave diffracts on the right uh, hand edge of the bl glass block. On figure 5.1, draw two crests. Um, draw two crests after they pass the glass block to show the diffraction. So they're asking us to draw draw two crests after the diffraction. So it's basically going to be um, it's going to be uh, something like this i believe yeah it should look something like this yeah. since the waves uh, above the glass block is not diffracted um, so that's why the uh, yeah that's why it is going to be uh, the yeah that's why the shape is going to be like this uh, make sure to make th this wavelength seem as close to the wavelength given as possible. Like, make sure that these lengths, these lambdas, are equal to this lambda, basically. Since in diffraction, there is no change in uh, wavelength. Okay. So, let's move on to part 3. Uh, describe how a wave with a smaller wavelength is made with the wooden bar. They're asking how uh, how to make a wave with a smaller wavelength, basically. So, uh, to make a smaller wavelength, we have to increase the frequency. So, if we uh, uh, if we increase the frequency of movement of the wooden bar, uh, the wavelength e is going to decrease. So, our answer is going to be uh, increase the frequency. of the wooden bar okay. next question describe how a decrease in wavelength uh, affects the diffraction uh, if the wavelength decreases uh, the di basically the spreading effect of the diffraction uh, basically depends on the uh, sorry the bending effect of diffraction basically depends on how close the uh, slit ga uh, the gap between the slits is 
to the actual wavelength right so if the wavelength decreases the difference bet between the wavelength and the slit width uh, basically it de it increases right so since the difference between them increases that's why the uh, bending effect will decrease so there will be less bend Okay, so that was it for question six. So question five. Let's move on to question six now. Uh, figure six point one shows the circuit. So this is the circuit. Um, resistance R. Okay. So they've stated that the reading on ammeter A one is zero point two five. So this is equal to zero point two five. Reading on voltmeter V one is three. So it's going to be equal to three. Determine the readings on the other meters. Okay. So one thing to say is that it is a series circuit, right? So since it is a series circuit, the uh, the current is going to be the same everywhere, right? So A1, A2, and A3 will have the same reading. So both A2 and A3 will also have 0 0.25 as their readings. Okay. Now for the voltmeter, um so now for the voltmeter uh there is three volts over here right uh well v1 is three volts right so v2 is going to be 12 minus 3 since uh the uh the sum of v1 and v2 is going to be equal to 12. so 12 is going to be equal to v1 plus v2 so if we make V2 the subject, it's going to be 12 minus V1, which is 12 minus 3, which is going to be 9. So it's going to be 9.0. Okay, calculate the f uh, resistance of uh, the resistor R. So they're asking us for this uh, resistance, right? Okay, so they're asking us for this uh, resistance. So we we can say we can say that the total resistance of the circuit is uh, sorry not total resistance so uh, we can basically use uh, the fact that we know that what uh, the current across this resistor is 0 0.25 and the volt voltage is 9 right so we have the current we have the voltage we just basically use the formula R is going to be equal to V by I. So V is going to be 9, whereas I is going to be 0 0.25. So our value of R is going to be 36. Yeah, it's going to be 36 ohms. Okay, let's move on to the next question. The resistor obeys Ohm's law. Okay, so they've, they've asked us to state Ohm's law, right? So... Ohm's law states that the uh, the current is directly proportional to voltage. Okay, yeah, the current is directly proportional to voltage, with, given that the temperature is constant. So let's write it down. Um, Voltage, okay. Is constant. Okay, so that's it for part three. In part B, uh, they've given this diagram of for the filament lamp. So this is the diagram for this over here so um, the battery in figure 6.1 is replaced with a different battery which has a different emf okay the voltage across the lamp is 6 volts okay so they've uh, they're, they're using a different battery okay the voltage up across the lamp is now 6 volts okay use this data uh, of the graph to determine the EMF of the second battery. 
So basically, they've, uh, the, the EMF over here, this is no longer 12, okay? They've used, they're, we are using a different battery and we need to find out the EMF. Oh, they're saying that the voltage across the lamp is 6, right? So 6 volts over here, let's uh, see what the current is. So if the voltage across the lamp is 6, the current should be... Um, should be this 0 0.35 right so that we have our current um, so we have our current through this and we have the resistor so let's draw another uh, circuit diagram so basically this is unknown this is the EMF E let's say and if we draw the diagram we have our R We have our R. So over here, the voltmeter reading is going to be six. Okay, so and the current flowing through it is going to be zero point three five. Okay, and we know that the value of R is going to be thirty six. We already know that since it is a fixed resistor. So, using uh, this value of R36 and using this current, current, uh, using these two uh, terms, we can find out the voltage over here, voltage V. So, if we find out the voltage and add it with 6, we find out our value of the EMF E. So, therefore, let's do it. Um, v is basically equals to IR. We know that the I is 0 0.35 and the R resistance of uh, the resistor is 36. It's going to be 0.35 times 36. It's going to be 12.6, right? Yeah. It's going to be 12.6 volts. And if we add it with 6, um, therefore EMF E is going to be 6 plus 12.6. It's going to be equal to 18.6 volts. Now, we have to convert all our answers to two significant figures, so our answer is going to be 19. 19 volts, okay. That is it for part 6. Let's move on to the part 7. Um, ultraviolet radiation is one component of electromagnetic radiation, sorry, electromagnetic spectrum. State the name of two components of the electromagnetic spectrum that have a smaller wavelength than, uh, than UV ray. So, Basically, let's write down the electromagnetic spectrum. It's G, X, U, V, I, M, R. So as we go, in terms of wavelength, wave, uh, wavelength decreases, right? Sorry, wavelength increases, actually, as we go to the right. So wavelength increases. So uh, we have our ultraviolet over here. So, over the uh, the rays on the right hand side of ultraviolet are they have wavelengths greater than ultraviolet, but these two over here they have wavelengths less than ultraviolet, right? So it's going to be gamma rays and X rays. Okay, so we have our answer. In A2, uh, they're asked to state one useful application of UV ray. So UV ray is used, uh, used a lot, actually. It's used in so many places. It's used to, um, it's used to you know, in those uh, crime films, you see those uh, policemen using uh, ultraviolet rays to find out fingerprints or any blood or anything. Ultraviolet is also used in sun beds. It's used uh, in sun tanning. It's used in solar panels. It's also used. It can also be used to detect counterfeit banknotes. Uh, it's used as dis disinfectant, and yeah, it has a lot of uses. So we just have to write down one. So let's write down. It is used in sun tanning. So yeah, um, sun tanning basically. 
in part three uh, exposure to ultraviolet uh, radiation from the sun damages the eyes okay state one uh, type of damage to the eye caused by ultraviolet so uh, if we look at the sun um, using our naked using the naked eye the ultraviolet should damage our retina or, and cornea it should burn or destroy our retina and cornea in uh, much severe cases or cause can cancer and yeah it can be quite harmful so let's write it that it destroys the retina okay so that is it for question 7a let's move on to 7b figure 7.1 shows a ray of light that the ray passes into a semicircular block of glass a and leaves the glass at b traveling uh traveling along the surface to c so basically this is the diagram state the name given to the angle uh, incident and marcus for so since the angle of refraction over here since this is 90 degrees we can say that uh, this uh, 40 degree angle is a um, this 40 degree angle here is a critical angle right yeah so the uh, in part 2 ca calculate the refractive index of glass okay. so one formula of re refractive index is n equals to 1 by sine c where c is the critical angle so we already know that the C from this diagram, we already know that C is equal to 40 degrees, right? So let's input that. N is going to be equal to 1 by sine 40. So N is going to be equal to, if we put it in our calculators, uh, it's going to be equal to 1.55, 1.55, which is basically two, equal to 1.6. So 1.6 is going to be our answer. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, figure 8.1 shows a step down transformer using to use to operate an electric bell. Okay, so this is a transformer right here. Say the material used for the core of the uh, of the transformer. It's going to be soft iron. Okay, soft iron. Okay. A current in the primer coil produces a magnetic field uh, in the core. Okay, explain how an alternating voltage is produced in the secondary coil. So basically, uh, when current is passed through the primer coil, uh, a magnetic field is formed since uh, current is passing. So since a, a magnetic field is uh, formed, uh, and we pass AC current, right? Alternating current. So it constantly changes direction. As such, the direction of the magnetic field constantly changes as well. Like for once, one instance, it's going to be north over here, south over here. Uh, and the very next instant, it's going to be south over here and north over here, right? So the, this magnetic field basically is uh, changing direction every instant, right? So as a result, um, the ma magnetic field in the primary coil, this changing magnetic field in the primary coil uh, cuts the wires over here. So there is magnetic flux and such as such and alternating EMF is induced on the secondary coil as well. Okay, so I hope that's clear. So we just have to explain that. So in order to explain that, um, I have to write that uh, the input input current is alternating this changing magnetic field um, in the primary coil field in the primary coil Um, induces an EMF in the secondary coil. Alternating EMF in the secondary coil. Current 
coil uh, as magnetic fields uh, field lines are cut as magnetic field lines are being cut so that is the explanation let's move on to part C uh, the transformer has 4600 turns on the primary coil uh, which is connected to the main supply of 230 volts okay. uh, an output of 5 volts is used to operate the bell calculate the number of turns uh, needed on the second regard so we just basically use this formula P uh, sorry uh, PV by PS is equals to the um, sorry 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 it's VP by VS sorry my bad uh, VP by VS is equals to um, NP by NS so VP is basically the uh, voltage in the primary coil which is two two thirty so it's going to be two thirty and Vs is the uh, required voltage in the second recoil, which is 5. It's going to be equal to the uh, number of turns in the primary recoil, which is 4600, divided by the number of turns in second recoil, which is which we just have to find out, right? So Ns is going to be equal to 4600 by 230 times 5. So if we do that, um, the number of turns is going to be 100. So that is our answer. In part D, they have asked us to state one change that can be made to a transformer shown in figure 8.1 so that it can be used as a step up transformer. So they want to use this as a step up transformer. So to make this a step up, a step up transformer, the secondary coil, the secondary coil should contain much more turns. So if we increase the number of turns in secondary coil or decrease the number of turns in primary coil, we can make it a we can make it a a step up transformer. We just have to make sure that the uh, number of turns in secondary coil is greater than the number of turns in the primary coil. Okay, so we can write that increase the number of turns in the secondary coil so that it is greater than the so that it is greater than the primary coil So that is our answer. Let's move on to question number nine. Okay, state uh, which type of radiation produces the strongest ionizing effect between alpha particle, beta particle, and gamma rays. So the strongest ionizing effect is obviously going to be caused by alpha particles, since they have the highest charge, which is two plus. Uh, state which type of radiation is deflected most by a magnetic field. They're asking which uh, radiation deflects the most. So it's going to be beta particles. A magnetic field. Since they have the least mass, they are going to, uh, they're going to deflect the most. Okay. Explain how, okay, uh, in figure 9.1, a geiger muller tube uh, and counter, a radioactive source is placed 10 centimeters from the GM tube as we can see over here in figure 9.2 a piece of metal uh, 5 millimeters thick is placed between the source and the GM tube the readings on the counter have been corrected for background radiation and shows the count weight due to the source so we have these two cases firstly the GM tube is measuring the count rate for the open source of open radioactive source and in the second case we just uh, we put a five millimeter thick uh, thick metal between the source and the GMP. 
So once we put the a five millimeter thick metal, uh, we see that our count rate decreases by six hundred. Okay, not sixty, sorry, six hundred. Explain how the readings show that the source emits beta particles and gamma radiation. So firstly, uh, it emits beta particles because since uh, uh, since when we put the five millimeter thick metal we see this change that is decreasing by 600 that's why uh, there has to be some uh, there has to be some radiation there which is stopped by five millimeter thick metal uh, that's why it has to be beta particle it cannot be uh, alpha particle because alpha particles is not present in this uh, source that's because alpha particles cannot travel more than two to three centimeters and we know that uh, the distance is already 10 centimeters so alpha particles are not present only travel up to two to three centimeters right so alpha particles are not present it has to be between uh, beta particles and gamma ray right so beta uh, beta particles are present since we see that it is being decreased by 600 and gamma particles are present because we still get a reading right uh, our count rate reading is not zero. They have already said that it's been corrected for background radiation. So this way, re this reading right here cannot be background radiation. It has to be some other type of radiation. So since it cannot be alpha particle, since it cannot be beta particles, it has to be gamma radiation. Okay. So let's write it down. In uh, yeah. So. basically um, okay sorry beta particles present because the count rate goes down down it cannot pass through the metal and gamma radiation is present because uh, we get our count rate as uh, it passes through the metal and we get a count rate. Okay, so that was it for question 9b. Uh, B1 basically let's move on to B2 uh, state why the readings cannot be used to show that the sources emit alpha particles oh I've answered this question before alpha particles only travel up to a few centimeters in air as such it cannot be alpha particles okay. so alpha particles are stopped by a few centimeters of air air so that is reason enough for it not to be present okay so part c describe one way that a radioactive source is moved in a school laboratory so can it's moved using uh use wearing protection and using tongs and handled at a distance it's put in a lead box so that all the the um, radiation is absorbed so let's just write that, that it is placed in a lead box
or a thick metal. So that is it for question C. Let's move on to question number 10. Okay. Astronomical distances are measured in light years. State what is meant by a light year. So uh, the definition is basically this is the distance traveled by light in one year. So distance traveled by light one year okay the sun is one star in the milky way uh, state the approximate diameter of the milky way galaxy so it is basically an approximation uh, a general knowledge question basically so the approximate distance is can be said is 100,000 light years okay. there are several uh, stage there are several stages in the life cycle of a star so uh, complete figure 10.1 uh, showing the stages of a massive star that goes through uh, after it has used up most of the hydrogen at the center of the star. So uh, this is the, okay, using the following words. So they've given us the words and they've asked us to fill in these three blanks, right? So they basically asked us what happens to a star after it is a red giant, after it uses everything up. So after it uses all of its uh, hydrogen up, it first becomes a super red giant. And then uh, from after super red giant, it turns into a supernova. So supernova. Followed by uh, after supernova, it becomes a nebula and a black hole. If the, uh, if the star is really big, uh, it becomes a nebula followed by a black hole and if the star is small it turns into a neutron star okay so that is going to be our answer to 10b let's move on to 10b2 state the stage in the life cycle of a star where heavy metal elements are formed uh, it's going to be uh, at a supernova So that is it for question 10b. Let's move on. Yeah, there is another one. Let's move on to question 10c. So current scientific understanding is that the universe began 14 billion years ago in an event known as the Big Bang. Okay, it is the Big Bang Theory. Explain one observation that supports the Big Bang Theory. So one observation uh, that supports the Big Bang Theory is the fact that um, the, the light from other galaxies, the light observed from other galaxies are redshifted, which means that their observed wavelength, um, observed wavelength increases and observed frequency decreases. So that is the observation which supports the Big Bang Theory. Um, uh, let's... Light from distant galaxies are redshifted. That is the observation. Now for the explanation uh, is that um, at the beginning of time when the universe first began, uh, everything was very dense it was it, all the stars and all the uh, galaxies and everything was very compact together and it was very dense and from and after that the big bang occurs and everything basically starts expanding more and more so yeah it starts expanding everywhere and that is basically the big bang theory and since it is expanding uh, the light uh, that we get the other galaxies and other stars they are moving further away from us right so since it is expanding we can uh, that's that's what explains the redshifts like since it is moving further away uh, what we observe from earth is going to be uh, when we observe light it's going to be redshifted and we get uh, that the wavelengths from those uh, stars and galaxies have a they have a longer wavelength and a smaller frequency so they basically get redshifted uh, 
be because they're moving away from us and they're moving away because the universe is expanding uh, since the Big Bang. So that is our answer. Um, at the beginning of time, um, all the galaxies and stars were close, were very close together. and dense and very dense uh, then the Big Bang occurred and the universe started uh, sorry the universe started expanding so universe started expanding So, um, so radiation from far away, away stars and galaxies, uh, are redshifted. So that is uh, that is our answer. Uh, instead of writing redshifted, uh, let's write that they have longer wavelengths. Okay, that's more clear. Galaxies have longer wavelengths. No. So that is it for question ten C. And I believe that's the end of the paper. Okay, so if you found this video helpful, do leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more content. Uh, you can share the video to any friends you have who need it. And uh, yeah, if I made any mistakes or uh, if you guys have any queries, leave them down in the comments below. You can support the channel by, by um, joining our Discord channel. Uh, which uh, from where you can get the notification of the all the new uh, uploads and the video schedules uh, you can also subscribe to our patreon to support us and yeah that will be it for this video and i'll see you guys on the next one peace